Welcome to Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba. The programming that you're about to see was taped earlier this year. Clearly, so much has changed since then, and unfortunately, a lot of uncertainty and fear remain. However, the issues and the topics raised in this edition of Lessons in Leadership will still matter once we get through these very challenging and difficult times. So without further ado, Lessons in Leadership. Welcome to Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Adubato. That is Mary Gamba. How are you doing, Mary? Doing great today, Steve. How are you? Good. Did you remember when I told you this baseball is all about and why I have it as a prop? Of course I do. What yes. Was? It is because you were the, uh, you got voted best coach of the year from your son's little league team. No, I'm kidding. But it was from your <laughs> son's little league team and all the uh, kids signed it for you as a gift. Why, why is it a joke that you wouldn't imagine or couldn't imagine that I would be <laughs> the best coach in the league? I just, I, I don't think it's a joke. I think that you definitely were. That's why I had to say no, it. I was the assistant to the assistant coach. Were you really? <laughs> and I said, kids, did you please sign my ball? No, oh. It's all true. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. Talk about learning about leadership. This is uh, Lessons in Leadership. Uh, Mary, tell folks wherever they can find us, which is expanding every day. Oh, my gosh. Every day. By the Go minute, ahead. every every time we do this. So, first of all, they can find us on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. They can subscribe there to get all of our podcasts. They can follow us on Facebook, Steve Adubato, Ph.D. That's A-D-U-B-A-T-O, as well as on Twitter. And also on AM 970, Fios on Demand, um, I'm what sure about on NJBIA, the business NJBIA, and industry association? Oh. com, which is our own website. We have a ton of valuable resources on our website, free columns, information on our books. Uh, all of our past podcasts can also be found there as well. Also want to plug our friends at the Business and Industry Association and ROINJ. It's expanding every time we do the program. I also want to thank our funders who make this program possible, the folks at Prager Metis, the great accounting firm, uh, New Jersey Resources, as well as uh, Hackensack Meridian Health, Valley, uh, the great Valley Bank. We're going to have Ira Robbins mm -hmm. going to be taping Absolutely. the CEO with us today and also uh, International Organization of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Enough plugging. We have our good friend and colleague, Dr. Brian Price is in the house, the executive director of the Bucino Leadership Institute at the great Seton Hall University. Good to see you, my friend. Go Pirates. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Steve, for having me. We should make this clear that we are taping this program. It'll be heard in 2020. Um, Brian not only is a hardcore Seton Hall University basketball and all sports fans, fans but we've been to games together. We, we root for the Pirates. We expect big things. By the way, Connect Leadership and the Seton Hall basketball program? Well, you know, it starts at the top, right, with Coach Willard and what he's doing with the team. And secondly, they're going to have to go through some a little bit of adversity here since Mamu got hurt. Talk, talk about that. Let me go back and talk about what the Institute is about. You have a game plan, right? You have your starting five, and this has nothing to do with basketball. It's about whatever industry you're in. You set your five players. You've got the next people you want to put in. Then one of your top three players gets hurt and is out for eight weeks. That could be any industry. What does that have to do with leadership? Oh, 100%. So in the military, we would say things like, uh, no plan ever survives first contact. Uh, Mike Tyson would tell you... Uh, Everyone has a plan until? You get punched in the face. <laughs> By the way, you mentioned military. I can't, you can, because... I, I a retired lieutenant colonel, served for 20 years, and uh, retired in 2018. Go back to this planning. I got a plan. I'm totally focused. I'm going to execute my plan. All of a sudden, things change. You lose your top player. The defense doesn't look the way you thought it would. The marketplace changes. Go ahead. Sure. Talk about strategic agility. Yeah, I mean, the only constants in any industry, whether you're talking about sports or uh, the business sector or even in higher ed, is change. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit later about how to, you know, lead this next generation of, of students sure. or, or leaders in terms of millennials and Gen Z. But uh, you have to be agile as a leader to survive today, because if, if you're not, uh, you know, you're, you're just going to get run over. Talk about the Bucino Institute. Yeah, Bucino Leadership Institute is a, is a pretty ambitious project. Um, you know that because you've been a part of the Bucino Center, which has been the leadership center um, in the Stillman School of Business for a long period of time, dating back to the 1990s. Uh, Karen Boroff and the previous president, Mary Meehan, uh, had this ambitious notion to expand that project uh, university-wide. 
uh, so that we can provide leadership development across the university uh, in an interdisciplinary way. And so President Nair, our new president, has Joe come Nair, on board. Right? Yep, absolutely, and has uh, supported the, the, the project. And we're in our second year, so uh, no sophomore slump for us. It's good stuff. By the way, uh, let's plug this. Uh, Brian's going to talk about the fact that you have your own podcast that we're going to be collaborating on in Which 2020. You have been on. Yeah, it's that was one of the. I really had a lot of fun on that. Describe what that is and how people can check it out. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we want to provide our students with a bunch of different types of leadership experiences. Uh, so, you know, leadership is a contact sport. You just don't uh, learn from reading it in a book, although there's some fantastic books out there. So we want our students to actually do leadership. And one of the ways that we tried to do that was to establish a weekly podcast focused squarely on uh, providing insights to undergraduate leaders because there's, while there's no shortage of fantastic podcasts, like this one. Uh, there are very few that I think are targeted specifically for that college age student. And so the it was an ambitious project. We have, it's completely student run, student mm -hmm. engineer, uh, student folks that uh, do background research, uh, that uh, produce, edit, distribute, um, all those sorts of things. And so it's the Seton Hall Undergraduate Leaders Podcast. Uh, you can follow us on um, all the same types of uh, platforms that you mentioned earlier in terms yep. of Apple, Apple and Spotify. Apple Podcast, Podcast, Google Play. And yep. Spotify. Yep. Speaking about it, this is a great production operation, but I've also been over to WSOU at Seton Hall, which is a nationally recognized college radio station and is where you do the podcast. It is. Um, you know, another great plug for Seton Hall and talk about a great leadership laboratory. Uh, WSOU, which is, I think, in its 65th year, 70th year, mm. uh, is completely student run. It's 24 7, won the Marconi Award a couple years ago for uh, best uh, college broadcast in the nation. Hold on a second. The Marconi Award. Who's it named after? Oh, will you stop? I'm Don't even. You, yeah, you're putting me on Who's the spot. Who's Marconi? You think I know? No. Marconi? Should I know? Yep. Oh. Discovered the radio. But go back for a second. I'm fascinated by this. Um, the military background you have. And again, I mentioned this book that you know very well. It's called Extreme Ownership, written by two Navy SEALs. Talks Shocker. about their experience. Yeah. And their experience in Afghanistan. Question. How much of who you are as a leader, how you lead every day, is based on your military background? Loaded question. Second part, how much of it do you have to leave at the door front you know, before you go in? Because 99 tenths percent of us, we don't have that background. We don't even know what you're talking about. Sure, I, but, I, but you do. Um, because I think at its heart, whether you're talking about military leadership or effective leadership today, uh, particularly the leadership brand that Seton Hall likes to promote is all about servant leadership. Um, putting others before yourself. And I think that type of leadership is not just, it, it is definitely needed to uh, succeed in the military and to, to thrive, but it's by no means unique to, um, you know, just the military. I think we see some of our most effective leaders today who are our servant leaders. Um, I think the one aspect that is unique with the military, though, is uh, when you are, you know, oftentimes if you stay in long enough, you're going to be forced to uh, experience leadership in crisis situations where they're, you know, everyone talks about life and death situations, but in the military, particularly if you've been deployed, um, you experience those things. And uh, that is a very different type of leadership experience. I will say, though, that that's not just military. You see that with our firefighters, with our first responders. We just saw what happened in Jersey City the We're other day. We're taking it right after horrific yeah. events in Jersey City where a very brave police officer um, was killed in the line of duty. Yep. Brian, I'm, I'm curious about something. And by the way, let's also disclose that uh, I will be proud to be teaching in the spring 2020 semester, doing a series of seminars uh, with Brian and the students up at Seton Hall University and the Bucino Institute. Okay, those students, do you believe that there's any significant difference, Brian, from, from being around and teaching the students you teach from say 18 to 22-ish? Mm -hmm. Do you believe there's any significant difference in the way most of them, I, I, don't, I don't like to generalize, the way most of them view leadership and what it takes to be a leader. And for some of us, we are different generations, obviously. Different time. Different? Yes. How so? So I think the most important thing is when you talk about millennials today versus uh, you know, your generation, you're a little older than I am, not much, but I think when we grew up, leadership had a very hierarchical 
nature. Top down? Top down. Bureaucratic, right? Yep. Um, you have to pay your dues uh, for a long period of time before you know anyone asks your opinion. And I think this generation, both the millennials and the Generation Z that's right behind them, um, are much more uh, comfortable speaking truth to power um, and don't want to pay their dues. And I think there's pros and cons t to both of that. What are the pros? What are the cons? Yeah, I think the pros of that is, you know, how long have, uh, just look at the private sector, uh, you know, for, for generations where you really didn't get a seat at the table until you were in, the, in a company for 20 or 30 years. Hmm. And so how many great ideas um, did not get, you know, bubble up to the surface until you had to pay your dues for 20 or 30 years? And so, you know, I think you see a lot of stagnant organizations. I'm looking at your table with the good to great book on it. Yeah, um, you know, Jim right Collins, here. you know, obviously studied those types of organizations. I think the con of this is when you have a generation that's, you know, generally in power right now that grew up in that hier hierarchical nature and now is dealing with millennials and Gen Z folks that, you know, are pushing back and want more earlier, that creates some, some friction in an organization. I want to just take a moment to once again, you ever notice how often we thank our sponsors? Love it. Have to. Tell folks why you have to. Well, I, uh, the folks wouldn't be able to get this great product. We wouldn't be able <laughs> to be in this great studio. Right. And uh, yeah, I, you, you have to. Taking and, care of others. And by the way, the Bucino Institute, funded by Mr. Bucino. <laughs> Dr. Bucino. <laughs> oh, sorry, Dr. Doctor. Bucino. Who Represent. Gra gradu he went to Seen Hall. He did. Good stuff. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Bucino, uh, <laughs> Jerry Bucino. How about this? I want to thank our, our uh, folks at Prager Metis, the folks who sponsor this program, Lessons Leadership. Mary, if I get this wrong... You'll correct mm -hmm. me, Prager Metis, New Jersey Resources, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, MD Advantage, St. Joseph's Health, Hackensack, Meridian Health, Valley uh, Bank, mm -hmm. our good friend Ira Robbins coming in here, the CEO there, and Gibbons PC. That being said, the other side of this whole millennial issue that we're talking about is this. I find it. And it's not just in our boys who, as we do this program, are 15 and 17. Mary's boys are? Uh, 14 and 17. Say they're moving into, you know, in a few years, they'll be 20-ish. My conclusion is that a disproportionate number of people in that age range, it's harder for them to, quote, own it, as we were talking about the book Extreme Ownership, to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any significant difference about taking responsibility for younger people today versus there was a consequence if we didn't take responsibility, at least for me sure. and my contemporaries? Sure. And I, I think that's one of the problems that we're trying to solve with the Bacino Leadership Institute. So one of the things that's unique about our program is it's four years. And so that requires um, and has a lot of touch points, a lot of high quality touch points with what that What do you mean by touch points? Meaning I will see that student every week for four years, most likely, on average. At a You're their coach. So, well, I, I often more tell, than the head of the institute. Yeah, I, I often tell parents, you know, unless your child is a Division One athlete, there's no other person at the university that's going to see your child more than I will um, during their four years. And what that touch points allows us to do, though, is to give feedback. And so it's not like you take a class and you, you know, have a professor and you, and you will never see that professor ever again. Um, or you, you know, do an internship where it's a six month thing and then you, you move mm -hmm. on. But in this situation, I will be able to provide you feedback. And we, we give all different types of feedback to our uh, to our students. Um, and that's how I think you grow. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is brought to you by Gibbons PC, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, New Jersey Resources, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. If you're listening to uh, Dr. Brian Price, Executive Director of the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Go Pirates. I'm curious about something as we're talking about this whole feedback thing, one of the books here it is. I'm looking for it's thanks for the feedback. I'm telling you, they're not just props. These are real books <laughs> that we've read. Every page, not every page, except for Mary. Of course. I feel uncomfortable oh. plugging my book. Would okay, you? So, so I'll do it for I'm you. I'm joking. So I have no we problem. We have Lessons there. in Leadership. You are the brand. Make the connection. I mean, the list goes on and on. I didn't say plug every book. Stop. We don't have time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Not enough time. It's too but, prolific. Yeah, but here's, here's the reason I'm mentioning it. The Feedback Thing, and Thanks for the Feedback, is one of my favorite books by uh, Stone and uh, Douglas Stone and Sheila Heen, H-E-E-N, is I think most people, Mary and I talked about this on a previous episode of Lessons in Leadership, 
my experience, I think it is more difficult than I ever realized for people, all of us to some degree, to receive constructive, direct, and sometimes you're not the greatest feedback. Correct. Yeah. I, can, um, you, can, you, can you actually learn to be better at receiving feedback or is it innate? No, I, I, I think it's a learned skill. And I would also kind of, uh, you know, dogpile on that and on the other side and say, I think it's sometimes very difficult for us to give critical feedback of others. And uh, how often do you receive training in doing that? Um, for not our, natural? For some people, it's not. For many. Yeah, I, you know, um, I, I think it is, a, it is a learned skill, but some people are kind of born with that uh, because it's a fear of confrontation. Um, Talk about that. Mary and I are mm -hmm. obsessed by this confrontation yeah. issue. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, about, about, I'm talking about healthy, constructive, important, strategic confrontation, not I'm a nasty person, I'm going to sure. argue with everyone. Yeah, I don't no, mean that. No matter how many times we do it, we still afterwards always regroup and say, wow, I could have done this better, or maybe I should have tried this, or I'll give Steve the feedback after he's given feedback to one of our team members. Say, Steve, really, maybe if you use these words instead, it might have been received a little bit better. So even as advanced as we believe we are in the leadership field, we're still learning every day. Oh, absolutely. And I don't think it's fun for anyone to mm -hmm. get critical feedback. However, you know, going back to the learn comment, you know, Dweck's research in her book Mindset talks about the difference Who's between this? a fixed and growth mindset. Who'd you mention? I think it's Carol Dweck is the, is the name. And the book? Uh, it's called Mindset. We will um, include it. Go ahead. A fantastic book that talks about... Um, how we all have areas in our life where we either have a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. If you've ever said something like, um, like I've said in the past, uh, I stink at learning new languages, that's a fixed mindset. Uh, if you had to flip it around to a growth mindset, it would say, I have in the past struggled with learning languages, but I'm capable of getting better. Um, and that little tweak um, is, is important. The second thing I would say is, just going back to your comment, Steve, earlier, is when you take a look at, just in sports, because this is an interesting context, you take a look at the best programs and the best coaches, and they all provide critical feedback to their players, but their players, you know, in the best teams are able to receive that feedback and improve. If you've never really received that kind of feedback, if you are used to you're the greatest, you're terrific. And I'm not going to get into this whole everyone gets a medal thing, a trophy thing. I, I think it's, there's something to it, but I'm not going to get into that right now. But if you grew up in a household or an environment, Mary and I t talked about how much of our style as leaders mm -hmm. is a product of what we grew up around. I grew up around uh, hearing constant, often very unhealthy criticism and feedback, like you, you stink, you suck, whatever. And that was from my dad. And with a lot of foul language in there. To me, that feedback, and I have to temper the feedback I give, which doesn't sound like that, I hope. The point is this. It's natural for me because it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Now, receiving it is more challenging, but giving it is more natural for me because I grew up around mm -hmm. it. What about you? Uh, so I, not, not that case. I mean, both of my parents were, were they really nice? Uh, yeah. Wow. Like what was that like? I'm unconditional. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to be surprised. I'm so jealous. I, I told Steve the same thing about me. My parents were very nice, very kind, very loving. It so was unconditional love. But I also yeah. think that you can be, you can give critical feedback and still be with love. Okay, a few seconds left. Explain that. Well, it's, it's difficult, but I think, you know, in order for you to, the other person has to understand that you care for them uh, beyond a transactional level. And I think, you know, obviously parents are sometimes better at doing that with their, with their kids. I think it's tougher for bosses to do that. But the first step is, you know, um, you know have you demonstrated the fact that, that, that you love and care for them? You grew up around uh, a family that was supportive of you? Uh, yeah, 100%. Wow. I I'm told getting, you, it is possible. Andy Slaffy, uh, Andrew, uh, Steve's I'm starting more to more realize exactly. What did, our, what did one of the, our other guests talk about? What was the show she loved? Oh, Little House on the Prairie. And, <laughs> yeah. I like, and I said, that's how I grew up. We were like, you know, dancing through the fields, picking flowers, but, but also, hugging. Like, I, like I want to like articulate, um, you know, it, it, our family, you know, I grew up with divorced parents, you know. How so old were you? I was in first grade when they divorced. Oh, wow. But my father moved about four blocks away from us in order to be with, you know, close to us. And so I was fortunate enough to grow up in a time where um, I saw essentially both my parents every day, even though they did not live in the same household. Wow. So uh, kudos to them for, uh, for raising. And they had, it was myself and my two brothers. C connect this for us. Your view of parenting, not versus leadership, but compared to leadership. 
Someone says, what are you talking about? One is parenting and their kids. They're 10, they're 12, they're 17, they're 15. Leadership and management is totally different. He's 42. Is it dramatically different? I don't think so. Like when we talk about our definition of leadership, you know, we talk about... At the, Bucino, the great Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University. In the Eco Pirates. Um, you know, we say, you know, it's, can you... Uh, Realize, go from vision to reality by maximizing the efforts of everybody on your team. Try that again. So, you know, can you achieve your, you know, go from vision to reality while maximizing all the efforts of everybody on your team? And so when you look at a family unit and, you know, parents and, and kids, I think, you know, it, it, the same rules apply. You have to model good behavior, right? You have to show them the way. Don't just tell them the way. Um, and then when it comes to maximizing their efforts, I think in this age of helicopter parents and everybody wants to step in, um, you have to take a step back and realize, is that going to be maximizing the, the effort of your child when they get into the real world and they find out that not everybody does get a medal? Uh, my daughter came home just the other day. She's, uh, she's 10. Shout out to Schmoopy back home. Um, <laughs> and she applied to get some, uh, sh they had applied to go to some art show. And she did not get it. Um, it How'd you deal with that? Well, what's interesting was um, I learned on a podcast on the way home, Adam Grant, who um, I, you may have uh, heard about, he does some organizational psychology, fantastic podcast. Uh, so he um, said, you know, what's the conversation that you always have with your kids, either after a sporting event or when they come home from we're school? We're just talking about this. Literally just talking about this. How many goals did you score? Um, uh, how'd you do in your test today? And so he said, flip the script and ask, um, who did you help today? Because he wants to grow. Change the questions. Change the questions. By the way, one of my favorite books, I hate that we keep doing this, yeah. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life Love by it. Dr. Mary Lee Adams. Why does, it, why does the changing of the question reframe the entire conversation? Uh, Dr. Brian Price from the Bucino Leadership Institute. So, you know, in this situation, he feels as though if we're trying to uh, model the best behavior in what we want out of our children, you know, one of those things that we want them to grow up to be is empathetic, kind, caring people. And so by asking the first question, which is, you know, uh, who did you help today or who helped you? That's wow. the other question. And so that's how I found out about my daughter not getting that event. I said, who did you help today? And she said, well, I congratulated two people that got this experience that I did not get selected for. And I was like, proud parent moment, you know? Wow. Um, she did that? She, that was the first words out of her mouth. And then she told me, and I didn't get it. And I was like, wow. And I knew how, she, how much she wanted it. Powerful We're going to keep her. Uh, yeah, I, I, I yeah, would do that for you. Our, our daughter's nine, Olivia, and who very results oriented. I'm going to keep that in mind. Well, it's um, so funny though, Brian, because Steve and I were talking before. I said I was I was trying to deal with something and how to how to deal with my child. Not not enough ice time in a game. He's an ice hockey player. Mm -hmm. And it's like what to say afterwards, right? When they're really young, it's a lot easier. Once they get to 10, you know, in this case, he's 17. I literally Googled like, what do I say, right? So when he drives sure. home and he walks in the door, and it said, say nothing. It said, literally hug him and say, you want something to eat? Because he already knows that he's disappointed because probably why he didn't get the ice time he wanted is because he wasn't performing in a certain way that the coach wanted. So to, to go into it and dig deeper, it, the thing that I read said, just let them process and let them learn so they can get those self-coping mechanisms and just, you know, move on and make them realize, hey, let's get something to eat because it's not life and death that you just, you know, had this happen. And, and to your point, you know, it's mm -hmm. so interesting because we have children, uh, our sons are 17 and 15. Mm -hmm. And as I said, our daughter is nine and I have an older son uh, graduated from Seton Hall with a master's degree in theology and religion and going on for his doctorate, awesome. um, teaching at St. Benedict's Prep. We talk about these things all the time, but what's interesting to me is that with our kids, sports, great metaphor for a lot of things going on, they're also potentially embarrassed when they don't succeed or do well or score the goal or make varsity or whatever it is. They're embarrassed with us. Yeah. Sure. Well, because it's in a public setting, too. I mean, they're embarrassed with their friends, their peers, you know, the parents. They feel like they've let the parents down. So, so, so yeah. stay on this. I asked, this started with a conversation comparing parenting to leadership. You said that, who was it said to flip the script again? Adam Grant. And the question was, who did you help today? Yes. Or who helped you? Yes. How does that, mm, but the kid is disappointed. Mm -hmm. How is that about leadership? 
so I, I love this. One of the things that we did with our oh, students. You didn't expect these questions. I know. <laughs> no, this is, uh, but this is awesome. This is why this is a great podcast. Um, and it's, you know, you ask great questions. It's what you do for a living. Um, so uh, one of the things we do with each of our uh, classes at Seton Hall, when the new leaders come in, so we have about 80 students from all across the university. And one of the things we ask them is, what is your definition of leadership? And we get all the answers. I put them all into, have you ever done a word cloud before? Yes. So I pump, pump them, them into a word cloud. put them up on a big PowerPoint slide. Go yep. Ahead. And so if you've never seen a word cloud before, the, the words that are more frequently used are larger. And yes. the words that are less frequently used are smaller. And so it kind of, it, it's great to kind of identify what are the, the common themes, but also maybe some subliminal things you might not catch in definitions. And I did it last year. And the word that the students came up with the one word that was larger than anything else was others. Others. I'm writing this down. Break it down for us. And so I did it this year, and lo and behold, and I don't give them any guidance. This is the first day, the first class that we have, and they come back with, you know, varying definitions. The word that popped more, out more often than others was others. Others. And so to answer your question is in terms of, like, why is that question so important? Is it in leadership? The, the question being, who did you help today? Yes. Is because if you go to a... Others' mindset, other people matter. Like, to me, that is at the heart of, of leadership. And that also is one of the things that gives me, um, you know, I'm very proud of our students. We talk about millennials and how selfish they might be or Gen Z folks might be selfish. And the fact that the one word that was common in both classes, they don't know each other, was others. So interesting, by the way, one of the little rocks I hold on to, you can't see it on camera, it's called pay it forward, which reminds me that we owe others so much. And the other thing is that in, in and this is not a plug, but in Lessons in Leadership, my book, one of the f chapters I enjoyed writing the most about empathy. You remember the subtitle of that? Empathy. It's all about them. It's all about them. And we put them in caps. And someone says, well, who's them? Mm -hmm. And the answer was anyone else other than you. The people who matter. How are you communicating to them that they matter? Them means if you're giving a presentation, I'm not going to get on my soapbox. If you're giving a presentation, I'm so nervous. What do I have to say? What about if I forget? It's all I. Mm -hmm. What about if I lose my place? What about if I get nervous? What about if they see me sweating? If you flip the script, I use your expression, mm -hmm. and ask, how can I be helpful to them, meaning who you're talking to? What is what I'm saying that has value to them? Am I making too much of this? No, I, it's, it's spot on. And I don't care if you're talking about parenting or uh, being a coach on your Little League team or running a business or Leadership Institute. Um, those rules apply. Final comments. Other than the fact that you're so excited about having me coming on to the faculty and teaching in the spring. We are. I'm joking. Stop. Um, other than that, the thing you're most excited about the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University coming in 2020 is? We are doing some fantastic new things with our students in interdisciplinary team projects. Interdisciplinary. Don't get academic on me. What does it mean? Um, you put a bunch of kids with different majors on a team on a semester long project, and then you give them feedback throughout. Um, so these students are identifying their semester long projects. So they are pitching the idea almost like a shark tank experience. Hmm. They are then going to, we're going to do like a fantasy football draft where they hire their own teams with the only prerequisite being that they uh, choose interdisciplinary, like instead of if you play fantasy football, instead of like a quarterback and two wide receivers, you got to pick a nurse and two business kids, two diplomatic kids, two education kids. And so we are going, and we also film some of those board sessions. So Outside I'm super their excited. world. Love it. Uh, this has been Dr. Brian Price, who's the executive director of the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University. I want to thank you for joining us, my good friend. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, we can't wait to have you come teach with us in the spring. Go Pirates. By the way, Mary, let people know where they can find lessons in leadership while we thank our sponsors that include uh, Prager Metis, RWJ, Barnabas Health, uh, Valley, the folks at Valley uh, Bank, Gibbons, PC, New Jersey Resources, MD Advantage. And where can folks find us? Absolutely. Uh, they can subscribe to our podcast at Apple Podcast and Google Play, as well as on our website, stand-deliver.com. And also on Facebook, Steve Adubato, PhD. On Twitter, Steve Adubato, A-D-U-B-A-T-O, as well as on AM970 the website. The AM970 website, and mm -hmm. also on ROINJ, on the Business and Industry Association New Jersey website, mm -hmm. Fios On Demand. Yes. This is Steve Adubato. That's Mary Gamba. That's... Dr. Brian Price, and um, check you out next time. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. 
That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is brought to you by Gibbons PC, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, New Jersey Resources, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825.